Welcome back inside the Parisi Palace at 2919 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, hour number two. Thank you so much for being part of the program today. The internal burn of freedom, the anguish from writhing at the bottom of the pit, the incentive is knowing that there is nowhere to go but up. My guest is one of the most precise, good-feeling drummers this host has ever heard. He plays the army drum roll and the 16th note on the hi-hat, He can play love songs, big bands, soul jazz, average white rock, and free music. The drum chair, the ability to swing the band in such a fashion that he's not stepping on toes, dancing, letting the music play the band. How did my guest find his own voice? My hunch was listening to records, woodshedding, and playing night after night on the bandstand. Stephen Ferroni, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you very much. That was very nice of you. It's nice to hear you, man. Is everything kind of figured? You figured everything out? Oh, I figured it all out. It's just been a week of disaster. Well, <laughs> I want to tell you. I'm, I'm just letting you know. Uh, I really appreciate you, and I. And this is only going to be part one because we, we don't we have too much to get to. Okay. Okay. You know, um, can you talk about how you learned, how you developed rhythm? Well. Um, I mean, I guess I was blessed with a certain amount of nat- natural ability. Um, when I was a little, when I was a child, I'd sit in the high chair and I would beat on the, I would beat on the, on the, on my with a spoon on my on the tray, you know, when they feed me. When I, we used to listen to the radio, we didn't have TV back in those days, back in the dark ages, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we listen. I listen to the radio and I'd listen to the music and I would bang a. And so as soon as I could walk, my, my parents decided that I should do something musical. So they uh, decided to, to, um, to, uh, to send me to tap dancing lessons. And, uh, and I did that for uh, um, uh, like nine years until I was 12. And so in, um, in all those, when I used to tap dance, we used to, they, they used to make me tap dance to these... Uh, uh, what they call standards, you know, um, begin the begin, um, old black magic stuff like that, you know, sort of songs like that. And right. So I became very familiar with the, with the, with standards, and um, and so I guess I learned more of how how to uh, uh, like the the the, the 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 partitions of a song, like the introduction, the verse, uh, the chorus, you know. Uh, the dynamic within the within within the song. So um, uh, that was kind of my first uh, um, uh, uh, experience uh, with with music and rhythm and syncopation. I wanted to, and I, then, you know I wanted to, I, I I wanted to ask because so many of the cats that I talk to, they um, you know whether it's John Abercrombie, a guitar player, he started playing with an organ, yeah. organ trio. And, you know, I mean, if you didn't have, if you don't have rhythm, you're not going to get a gig. And, you know, right. I wanted you to talk about, even in England, I mean, literally, I'm looking at your Wikipedia page, Stephen Ferroni is an English drummer, boom. And that's the end of your history in England. But can you talk about 
I mean, was your first gig with like an organ trio? Can you talk about who the first leader you worked with was? Well, the the first band that I worked with, you know, I was twelve years old, and um, what had happened was was that you know I I just sort of finished doing this. Uh, I, I was in a what they call a summer show. Uh, I guess they call it summer stock here, uh, where 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 you know, we lived in a seaside resort and, uh, and where there was a theatre, and um, you know so these TV personality stars would come and they they would do a summer season. Uh, and the tourists uh, from all over the country would go and see these people. It would be something to go and see at night. And, uh, and I, I got a job in the in the children's chorus in one of these summer shows. And um, while I was up up on the stage, like you know, dancing and singing and doing my thing, I, I glanced down into the music pit and I saw the drummer saw the drummer playing, and I saw what he was. I saw how he was playing. I saw I saw him. You know, playing like eight notes and playing a backbeat, mm-hmm. and 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 it and it looked kind of weird because it was, um, yeah. Although I understood what he was what he was doing and what it was sounding like, it, the mechanics of doing it seemed a little bit strange. So I went and I I taught myself how to do it, and that was the uh, that was kind of the the, the start of a, of um, of of, of a drumming for me, and then uh, and then uh, we used to go. To uh, uh, to to to, to, to da- there used to be a dance hall for ch- for for young kids, you know, for for little kids. Sure. And it was in in a place for bigger kids, and uh, uh, <laughs> you know, teenagers used to go there. A place called the Regent Ballroom. It's not there anymore. They knocked knocked it down years ago. But the the Regent Ballroom uh, used to have this Saturday morning thing for young kids, and people would drop their kids off there and then go shopping. And um, I used to go up there with my with my little gang of, of friends, and we used to go dancing and dance with these girls. And I was a pretty good dancer, and the girls used to like dancing with me. <laughs> but but uh, but one day this band Manfred Mann's Earth Band came, and they they were they were playing for the uh, uh, that evening in the in the in the ballroom, and uh, they did their sound check, and they did their sound check for us little kids. And every girl in the place just went berserk. I mean, they were screaming and you know going crazy for these guys that was playing music. And I said, said to my friends, you know, that, you know, that's what that's what we need to do. We need to do that. So, um, in terms of no, but I mean, I just want to be clear. You wanted to get girls excited. Yes. You weren't. Nece- <laughs> you, you weren't necessarily. Yes, you, yeah, you weren't necessarily. We did, yeah, go ahead. We we didn't really get any girls. The local girls weren't really interested in us. You know, I mean, <laughs> we used to have to wait until the summer when the Swedish girls arrived. You know, as, as, as little kids would sort of learn how to speak a little bit of Swedish. And svenska flika botska the go You know, <laughs> your girls could date. I dig. I dig. I dig. I dig. Yeah. So so that was that was about it for us, you know. And, uh, and but the local girls just really didn't want to have anything to do with us. But but, but then these you know these musicians was a whole different musicians was a whole different story. So um, so we decided we were going to sit down and learn how to play. So we one of the kids uh, he, he had a, he had a real guitar. His parents uh, uh, owned a garage and they had, they had they had some money and uh, they bought him a real guitar because we were all pretty poor and um, and. Um, and uh, 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 I had like a like a toy drum kit, you know. My grandmother bought me like this one drum that was a real drum, and, right. uh, and, uh, and it was crappy cymbals and stuff. And we'd sit down and we'd you know play, try to play songs. And so the kid who had the real guitar used to hang out in guitar shops, you know, like kids kids who have like real instruments. They sort of hang out around guitar shops and. And they sort of hang out around the older kids who have bands and everything, you know. So he, he was uh, he was one of those kids that would hang out around, try and hang out with the older musicians, the uh, the eighteen year olds, you know. And uh, and there was a band that was playing, and uh, they they uh, their drummer uh, uh, was sick, and they, he couldn't make this gig, you know. And uh, and so they were in the shop, and they were. You know, talking about I guess they were talking to the owner of the shop and putting up notices and need a drummer for one one gig and everything. And this kid told them about me, and uh, and they said, well, okay, well he's kind of young, but bring him down and we'll try him out. You know, and so 
he came, the kid came running around to my house and said, hey, listen, you know, there's these big kids and they got this band and they're going to play this show. They're going to play this uh, this youth club. Do you want to do you want to come and, uh, you, know, do you, you know, do you want to go and try out with them and everything? And I said, yeah, sure, that'd be fun. You know, go. On. So I went running over there. I said, there's the drum kit. And, uh, and I, I just went running over there with my with my drumsticks and uh, and. Uh, and uh, and I sat down and rehearsed with them, and then then and I and then they said, okay, you you can play the gig on on, on Saturday night. So I went and played the youth club with them on the Saturday night, and then, and then they sort of kept me as the drummer. They fired the they fired the guy when he came out of hospital, and um, right. and I was the drummer. And we called ourselves the Flames back then. And I, somebody actually sent me a photograph of that gig. I have a photograph of the first gig I ever played. Was it a was it like an R and B a rock? Well, how would you describe the music? No, it's a blues band. It's a blues band. Yeah, uh, and they used to write some. They used to write some original. They wrote some sort of original bluesy sort of songs, twelve bar blues stuff. Chuck Berry. Um, they used to take me to go and see these blues tours that came through Brighton. There used to be these blues tours and M- Muddy Waters and uh, uh, John Lee Hooker. Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. I really liked them a lot. Uh, and um, so, so, um, I was, you know, yeah, so that, that was my first experience. The second s- experience was, yeah. uh, was an organ trio. Oh, okay. So let's, let's yeah. get in. I want to, I want to, talking to Stephen Ferroni here, one of the most gifted, powerful, graceful drummers I've ever heard. And, uh, um, okay. So in the organ trio, uh, was it a was it a black organ? Who was in the Who was the What was the trio comprised? Of? No, no, <laughs> it was called the Plain and Fancy, and there was a guy named Alan Moskop who was uh, who's actually his family were from Belgium, but he, he was uh, born and raised in Brighton, and uh, he had a Hammond organ. It was I think like maybe like a C one or something like that. Not really, not wasn't a B anywhere near a B three. Thank God because. <laughs> We used to have to carry it up and down stairs. It right. seemed like every gig that we played <laughs> after that was at stairs, and so we would be lugging this organ up and down. And he was really anal about it. He would cover it up and, you know, wrap it up in stuff because he didn't want any scratches on the organ and what have you. Yeah. You know? And and uh, there was a girl, Christine. And she used to. Uh, it was his girlfriend. She used to play saxophone. Wow. And a bass player, which was Christine's cousin, Glenn. And he, used to, he, he, I don't know what happened to him, but then he went away, and then there was another bass player came. Uh, I forget that guy's name. Were you and guys? Then, were you guys like playing, uh, like like Jimmy Smith and Coltrane tunes? What were you playing? Yeah, no, we, we were playing more like Jimmy Smith stuff. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. and 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 uh, and uh, you know, songs like Barefoot and but we would be with like like R and B with a with a with a with an organ, you know. So we play like. Um, hold on, I'm coming, stuff like that, you know, but with an organ. Yeah, I was going to, I wanted to ask you, part of my show deals in the metaphysical, and I've I've done four long-form interviews with guys like Billy Cobham, talked to McLaughlin, um, uh, Keltner. Uh, I want to ask Ferroni, because when I listen to you play, it it seems like it's almost so, I know you're learning every day, but I know there. it seems like it's so second nature uh, with the chops, fusing it with the feel but I wanted you to talk to the audience about an out-of-body experience that you had on the bandstand. Ooh, ooh, well. This is not your garden variety radio interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, let me see. Out-of-body experience on the bandstand. God, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can... Uh, uh, I think that, the, 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 you know, the, there's been a, I, I guess there's been a, uh, I call them magic nights, you know. Right. Um, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it, it's a night when you can, when you can actually do anything. You can, um, you, you make a mistake and it, and it works out right. You know, <laughs> you drop a stick and it just makes a noise that's perfect. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, the, and, they, and they come few and far, but they come few and far between. Um, they're pretty memorable, and, and and it's and it's also it's also a night when it's not just you, when it's the band, when everybody in the band knows that something happened. 
You know, it, everybody in the band had a great night. Right. Everybody in the band, everybody caught all the dynamics in the, and, um, you know, there are kind of few, problems. I think they've happened, uh, I mean, uh, I know they happened with Average White Band, and, um, uh, 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 I would say that, that most of the, the, the bulk of the live album from, uh, from, uh, uh, person to person was taken from a concert in Cleveland. And and that was one of those nights when it was just everything just sounded perfect to sing. Play, people play perfect. I mean, you know, listen back to it; it's got its flaws certainly, but but uh, um, uh, 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 there was an atmosphere, there was a feeling about it that that was just right. That was uh, the, it's a popular album because of that. It just felt right. You know. Do you think that that is the? I mean, there's only two letters that separate magic and music, and I just wonder if. You, you called it Magic Nights. Uh, yeah. Billy Cobham was talking about a, a tour that was wrapping up a Mahavishnu tour where he was exhausted, like very yeah. tired. And it was the last leg of a show. It was a three-hour you know, marathon. And all of a sudden, he was on the... Even though he was playing drums, he was on the side of the stage looking at himself. Play. He was so physically exhausted that he was outside of his body. You know, I mean, right. it was one of these powerful moments. And I, I look at music today. It is so, um, you know, manufactured. It's it's digitized. It's very tight. It's very perfected. And yet right. I, I'm, I'm longing as a 37-year-old cat for that spiritualism. And would you say it's a spiritual thing when that drumstick falls on the ground, when everybody's locked in? I'm really searching because I think that's where music transcends this pacification period that I believe we're living through. Absolutely. Uh, 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 you know, it's, um, I mean, some of the magic moments on records have been mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> right. It, it's, it, and, and you, you make the mistake and you just keep going, you know, and, <laughs> and, and then everyone says, wow, why did you do that? And it's like, well, because <laughs> I screwed up. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I remember, I remember one night playing with Clapton, uh, and it was, I think it was one of the, one of the Albert Hall series, one of the, the 24 night series. It was one of those nights where the band was really in tune, you know, and, uh, and, 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 um, for some reason, uh, it, Eric was about to hit this solo, right? And, and for some reason I decided to break the whole band, break the band down, like go really quiet, mm -hmm. right? And. Mm -hmm. And, and it was usually a point where Eric would just like play really loud. And I thought, well, this, this might work if I just break the band down uh, and just let Eric go really loud on his own, you know? And, uh, and, and I remember, and I, and I just broke the band down, and Eric hit his pedal, hit the pedal. And what happened was he didn't have the volume up, but he was playing loud. Right. You know? And it was an accident that if I hadn't have broken the band down at that moment, then you wouldn't have heard it. Right. right. But it just I, know, I broke the band down. The whole band, and it, like I say, the band was a really in tune. The whole band just dropped in level. And Eric played this <coughs> really loud <coughs> guitar solo with all the sustain, all the, all the, just, it just sounded loud, but it was really quiet. <laughs> And it was just one of those moments that, you, you know, you just don't forget that, you know. It's just something that that, that just happened that was a complete accident. Uh, and then there was, there, was another, there was another gig that we played with, with Clapton that was in, um, in uh, uh, um, uh, Mozambique at the, at the, um, at the uh, um, it was at the, uh, uh, there was a big peace conference because they had a horrible, Civil War sure, went right. on there for a long mm -hmm. time. They had this big conference, and because of the peace had broken out, for some reason we went there and played. Now nobody knew who we were, and there was a big stadium full of. Oh, it was like complete opposite of what we were used to seeing, <laughs> which is like a sea of white faces with the occasional black face. This was a sea of black faces with the occasional white face, and and I don't really know if they knew who we were, but they showed up for this concert. And uh, and we started to play this song called uh, um, "Same Old Blues," which is it's a do 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 do, 
And so we started to play that song, and for some reason, it resonated with that audience, and they all started to groan. They, started to, they all started to think, ooh, ooh, and the, like 90,000 people all doing that at the same time, and they just started chanting and swaying, and it was just incredible. Wow. It made you wonder if they were sort of going to attack. <laughs> you know, Stephen, uh, Stephen, this is exactly what I want to talk about, though. I mean, it, you were in Mozambique. Uh, yeah. How much were you into the idea? Or, uh, it's not the idea. It's real. The language of the drum. I mean, you're talking about the idea that it's not just something to keep time with, but that, in fact, the slaves used to use the drum as a means of communication. That's what was really going right. on. There. Yeah. I mean, can you talk about well, Yeah, talk about that, how much you, you, you I mean, whether or not you've read a lot of books on it or i just i love the idea of uh of the idea that, that the drum is much more than just a timekeeping instrument yeah i mean you know there's i i think um you, you know my favorite drummer is is uh is jack de Jonette. Uh -huh. and uh and 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 i have nothing to i don't play anything like jack de Jonet and, and i don't never pretended to play anything like jack de Jonet or but so people would say, like, well, how, how you know, well, what do you get from Jack to Johnette? And and the, the the fact of the matter is, is that for me, he is so musical when he plays. He he can he can spot something within a band and and uh, and make it important. You know, he can make one little riff important. He just has a way of listening to the band. I think you know, Kelton is a, a, that kind of a drummer too. That, that, that he lists, that he that, that he listens. Now, when I worked with Brian Orgo, there was a a, 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 a conga player, a percussionist, a guy named Lennox Langton, and Absolutely. he lives in the south of France now. And Lennox was from Trinidad, and he was totally into into uh, 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 Afro Cuban music. Oh, and he t he turned me on to listening to Mon Mongo Santa Maria, Ray Barreto. Um, uh, 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 and he, and he also turned me on to listening to African ritual music, and and African ritual music, when you when you start when you listen to it, it just sounds like this jumble of noise. <laughs> yes. You know, it yeah. sounds like it sounds like you put um, a bunch of different stuff in the trash can, and then you shake the trash can. <laughs> you know? But over time, but, yeah. 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 But he he had. He could spot, he could point out the guy that was at the center. He could find the guy that was at the center. And then once he honed in on the guy that was in the center, then the next guy was playing something off of what the guy who was in the center was playing. And then the next guy was playing something off of him or both of them. And then the next guy was playing something off of one of them. And then so, and, and so on and so on and so on. So you had like a hundred guys all playing something that was all off of something that was all these different sounds that was going on that were all actually playing off of each other, that were playing something that made this cacophony of, of like a bunch of stuff in a, in a, in a dryer. <laughs> yeah. You know? Right. But, but it didn't, it didn't sound, it, it, there was a, co there was, there was a communication pattern going on. Absolutely. They were listening to each other. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's so much about what you're saying. It's more about what you're listening to. Stephen uh, Peroni, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I want to yeah. tell you, man. I I am very. Um, I'm. I hope that everything works out with your sound system. Uh, can we please do part two? Because I did not get to anything I really wanted Absolutely. to talk. Absolutely, I'm right. really sorry, but you have to blame God for that. I'm going to blame. No, and, and actually, it's it's very fortuitous. And uh, yeah. and I want to thank you for helping me with your power and burning. Uh, to help, that's just helping me get through time. And uh, and we'll be in touch, Mr. Ferroni, All right. Thank you very much, and I'm truly sorry about Don't what worry about happened it. today, but it was something that was completely out of my hands. Yeah, set two, baby. Coming up, all right? <laughs> all right. Later on. Thanks a lot. Peace. Bye. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. It's a good time. Thank you to Skip Taylor, Jackson Kraft, Stephen Ferroni, and Dave Mason coming up at the Fox Theater. We'll see you next week.
Sports trending now. Patriots and Chiefs are set to kick off the weekend's NFL Divisional Playoff slate in just about a half hour from now. Receiver Jeremy Macklin is active for the Chiefs, as is pass rusher Justin Houston. Patriots will have Rob Gronkowski, Julian Edelman, and Danny Amendola active for the offense. Sea Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you live on Power Talk, please go to our website, powertalk.live, download our free app, and stream all of our live local shows, including Solomon on Blast and yours truly, The Jake Feinberg Show. We can't thank you enough for making us part of the program today because, let's face it, I get to interview uh, the cats, the real cats. And uh, last time I engaged my uh, my, my guest, uh, he was in the midst of uh, you know carnage. Uh, his studio was kind of f- falling apart at the seams. Uh, we had uh, we had a, a really hot, quick kind of first set, uh, ready to dig a little bit deeper. Stephen Ferroni, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hey, how you doing? How you doing, my man? I fixed my studio. It's working great now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I, you know, um, so great to talk to you, man. I, you know, I, I just, you know, I remember talking to Chuck Rainey a while back, and, um, you know, after a while, when you have uh, have had a lot of success. Uh, you've carved out a niche for yourself in the studio with bands on the road. You've seen it all. You've done it all. Um, your your ego comes into play, and you start having to what he referred to as manage your ego. And I just wanted you to mm-hmm. talk to younger cats, more insecure, about a point in your life when, or at a time even now when you are still managing your ego, how you do it how ultimately you come to peace with it because, uh, yeah, just riff on that. Well, you know, I mean, uh, I, I, I was, um, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, a, 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 horribly a memorial for a guy the other, the, the other day. And, and they were talking about his career and about how it had only gone but so far. And, 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 and uh, it, it, it's funny because, uh, you know, the, the being, being in being a musician and being a studio musician is, you know, no matter how good you are, you're still in the place of service. You know, uh, uh, you, you, you're still you're still trying to um, make somebody happy. And even if they even if they're doing something that's a little bit strange or something that you don't think that you wouldn't do, go about things that way. It's it's just really a question of like you know, uh, managing a how you say it. The, the attitude that you have when you say something and, and B, just being prepared to accept that if they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. They sign the front of the check and you sign the back. That's right. You know? Right. No, I did. Can you talk about, so let's, I think you nailed, let's, what, what is your attitude? How do you, cause you know, for me, somebody comes at me sometimes, I mean, I'm not a musician, but you know, yeah. they're doing something weird. Uh, yeah. and it's throwing you off, throwing me off. And I, I don't necessarily have the, what do you can you what do you say how do you how do you how do you deal how do you uh take your attitude and uh infuse that into a situation where you know you're not even affected by what this person's doing well i think i think the first thing the first thing to do is to try and understand what it is that they want you know uh, maybe the, is the if they don't have really have the experience of explaining how they want it done you know, uh, or what it actually is that they're looking for, you know, is to try and get an understanding of what it is that they want and then find a way to give it to them. For example, this is an example. I, I, I was doing a session once with a guy and, and he wanted a fill going into uh, um, a, a section. And uh, so... The take was good, but he just wanted to fill there at this spot, you know. And and so he said, "Could you play like you know, like that's okay." So I play Could you play It's not really what I would normally play, but that's it. So I played it, and no, that wasn't it. And he went went backwards and forwards and so it's naming all these fills. And I said, "I tell you what, I'm going to do. Let me just give you." Let me give you a feel there. The the I got a feel, a special feel, <laughs> and I'm going to put it right in there okay. for you. Right. So I played up to it. I did a pause. 
I did one backbeat and started back into the song again. Dun dun touch it, zoom, bap, boom, solid downbeat, and he and he went berserk. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so we spent some time messing around. Spent a lot of time, wasted some time messing around trying to find this dang fill, and it was really quite simple. It was more of a feeling that he wanted than an actual fill, you know. Exactly. So, yeah. I, so, I, so, I mean, you happen to be very gifted. I mean, that, that that's pretty cool to be able to, you know, say, I know what you're, you may, you may think in your head, you know what you're looking for, but I think I got something in my bag. Not everybody right, has right. a deep bag like that, but I dig. I mean, to, yeah. I mean, I, you know, who, who, what are the best qualities of leadership, Steve? And like, I mean, you as, as a, have you been a leader of a band? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you can, <laughs> t- t- tell me, tell me, tell me about, uh, the, the, b- what is the challenges? Okay. So you talk about like in the studio, uh, yeah. having to, uh, you know, you're still there. You're being paid to make somebody's rec- music sound better. You know, but when yeah. you're a leader, what was the hardest transition for you to become a leader? And 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 how? Well, and, go ahead. I, I think this is this is the thing is like, you know, you tend to you tend to, you actually get an appreciation for what what a leader goes through. You know, I mean, it's like the you know the, the number of times that you sit there and you work for somebody and they they you know they they want to do something and you say, oh god, jeez, you know, well, well I don't right, want right, to do that. Right, right. <laughs> Okay, I'll just do it. I'll keep the guy and I'll go and do it. And then all of a sudden, when you're a leader, you find yourself that you are that asshole. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're, well, why is that asshole? Why does he want me to do that? And all of a sudden, you become the asshole. Because basically, when it comes down to it, is, is that the whole thing is on you, anyways. Right. Yeah. Right. When you're the lead, when you're the leader, it's your reputation. It's your. It's your thing. And and you have these great musicians, and all you want them to do is to give you what you want because you have a concept for how you want it to be presented, yeah. You know? And so so yeah, it's, it's it's hard to be a leader, and especially to be a good to be a good 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 leader, you know. It, you know, uh, uh, you, you hire you hire people you hire people because you know that they can play, but then every once in a while there'll be something that you you'll want to get that you're not getting, and you you have to ask them to do it, you know. Right. I mean, I I interviewed John May all this week, and and he he was really um, uh, restrained in the in the sense that it, it wasn't any more complicated. You know, he'd come to the, when he came to the states the second time and put together this jazz fusion group with Blue Mitchell and and Freddie Robinson and Keith Hart yeah. Keith Hartley. You know, so very much out of the same vein as like you know the 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 auger groups or, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, 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 uh, he just said, he goes, you know, I get music in my head. Uh, I try to bring people in that I believe can help me make that music. And then, and then we play it. But I, you know, inevitably it's like, I just wonder sometimes about, um, you know, if you feel like the most important thing is for you as a leader, because like you said, you become the asshole, quote unquote. I mean, yeah. I mean that whatever yeah. that, that you just want to make it sound as good as possible. But well, I've turned around to some guys and said, you know, I hear this note there, and 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 and, and they said, well, that note, that's not right. And I said, it might not be right, but that's what I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's my it's my session, yeah. baby. I dig. And then it's like, well, you know, well, okay, well, we can make it work. Yeah, okay. So they make it work. <laughs> I love it. Once it sounds, once it sounds the way that you want it to sound, then it's right. You know, and uh, you know, and, and 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 I think that you know, every leader, every leader, every leader of a band has that has that problem. And 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 I I, I can actually tell you that I became way more sympathetic after to leaders after I, I I had to do it once or twice. You know, and it was like you know. I kind of understand what they have to go through, so it's a uh, you know, it's a, it might not be right, but that's what they want. You know? do, do you do you do you try to make it a point to bring in cats that, and and you let them express their own individual? Sound? Oh, absolutely. You have to absolutely, yeah, yeah, ab- yeah absolutely. But you know, also, if somebody's doing something that you don't like, it's you know, because you can say, yeah, I don't, yeah. That's not really it. That's not what we want. Looking for. Can we try that a different way? And most guys, you know, you just sort of, if you can just nudge them in the right direction, they they, they sort of get it right away. Uh, sometimes you can just turn around and say, 
uh, I want that to sound. Yeah, you know, I remember once I was working with a keyboard player, and he was playing. He was playing a certain thing in a certain way, and I said, "Can you? Know, do you think you need sort of put like make make that more like Richard T. sort of feel?" And 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 immediately he got it. You know, he knew exactly what it was, and and he just played it, and that was it. And it, yeah, you know, it, it was uh, just just his interpretation of his first interpretation wasn't what I was looking for. You know, so you can just sort of nudge somebody a certain way. You know. And, uh, and the guys that I know, that you know, they play pretty much anything. You know, uh, one of the things I like to do on my program is to illuminate people all over the world about the careers of cats. Who, obviously, Stephen Feronia has been a leader, um, uh, prolific leader. But uh, we we have a game on this program called uh, Name That Tune. I want to put this in for you for a second, and then uh, we'll come back and break it down. Okay. 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 I fall down. On the Jake Feinberg Show, brought to you in part by the Jewish Federation of Southern Arizona, and we thank them for their support. All right, Mr. Ferroni, what do you got for us, brother? I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I, 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 this is this is why I do my show. Uh, that was, uh, I mean, one of the first. I actually discovered this after. Uh, uh, the 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 Oblivion, Oblivion Express. This is uh, maybe your maiden voyage with uh, Bloodstone, Riddle of the Sphinx. Ah. Name of that tune. Name of that tune is Sign for Me, Dad. I mean, what a funk fest that was. Dude. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you better pull that That's album. Me? That's you, man. I, you know, I, I want. Yeah, I mean, you can you do you. Uh, I mean, they were a sole outfit from the UK. Do you can you illuminate us on how you even connected with them originally? Well, no. Well, actually, they 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 they're from here. They, 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 Bloodstone was from here. Oh, they are. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, the um, the, um, uh, the 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 producer, the, the the same producer who did uh, uh, Freddie King's Burglar album, uh, Mike Vernon. Uh, told me that he was doing that. He was working with this band Bloodstone, and I'd heard that they had a single, Natural High, that was that was a that was a pretty um, uh, uh, popular. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he said that uh, you know he asked me to come over and uh, um, and and play with them, and so I came over and and did some recording with them, and then uh, uh, they they started to work on this movie. Uh, train ride, train ride to Hollywood. I think it was called. That's right. And, uh, That's and, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, and um, and uh, I, I came over and uh, and and uh, and I and I worked on that with them, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun because they were kind of unusual for, for 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 what they were as for what they were known as, you know, which is a sort of a, a sort of stylistic sort of a band. You know, the Natural High was that was it was that big hit. But they were actually a self-contained band. They, you know, they played they played their instruments, uh, um, um, and they had these wonderful voices, you know. And uh, uh, so it was it was it was a little bit different as far as you know. It wasn't four guys that sang and had a backing band. It was it was an actual band, and so so it was uh, it was a lot of fun working with them. Do, you know, I was yeah. going to ask you this: uh, if you could talk about. Um... I asked Dr. Lonnie Smith about, not Lonnie Liston Smith, but Dr. Lonnie yeah. Smith about um, the difference between a soul drummer and a jazz drummer. Can you, can you talk about rhythmically how you, um, if you could talk about the differences in, in how you time your, in, in, in how you time your beats and how, and even how you just play rhythm because, like you said, it, the you know what we just heard was yeah. was more soul, more uh, a fun, funky st uh, tune. You listen to the Oblivion Express, and there's like you know you're doing freedom jazz dance, and you're doing jazz. Right. You know, so can you? Talk, could, I mean, I couldn't think of anybody better to ask about just splitting the hairs and talking about soul drummer versus jazz drummer. Well, I I, I don't think that there really is that much a difference i think there's just a, a, a difference in the style of the music that you're playing mm -hmm. i mean if you if you look at benny benjamin he was a bebop drummer that's right you know that's right who who, who played on 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 uh, i don't know <laughs> question questionably one of the most recognizable drummers soul drummers around 
What do yeah. you, um, was, hold on? Do, do you know who he played with in the bebop? Like with B, did he, who did he did he play with? I, don't know. I, I I just kind of read up that he used to play the, uh, well, all of them. Jameson as well was an upright bass player. That's right. Continue. Uh, yeah, uh, it doesn't and matter. And they they used to just play around the play around the clubs in Detroit. You know, I so, did. You I know. did. Yeah. And there were plenty. So of, we're, there were cats like Yusef Latif there. So they were playing bebop, but then they fit right into the Motown thing. So continue. Absolutely. Well, you know, the other thing too is that you know, the other week I saw I was, I was with my friend Harvey Mason in Japan, and and uh, we oh. we were hanging out, and 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 it's like if you listen to Headhunters, it, you know, it, it, it has an R and B. Harvey plays very lightly. He's a very light playing drummer, mm-hmm. He's not, but he doesn't sound when he records. He doesn't sound that way. You know, it sounds like there's an enormous backbeat. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Oh no, I mean I'm, I'm, uh, I love this stuff. It's it's about it's, it's about generating sound without having to pound the drum kit. Exactly, he has tongue, and Benny <laughs> Benjamin was was the same was the same was the same sort of deal. Now, if you look at Gadsden, he's more of a pure, pure more of a pure R and B R and B drummer. You know? Right. Uh, uh, I guess another guy that would that would uh, that would that would sort of go between the two would be Clyde Stubblefield. You know, uh, right in between there, there's a, there's these guys that, that that played bebop. There were bebop players that go, suddenly got put into this R and B sort of thing where they, they, their swing was apparent, uh, but they had to play more of an R and B groove, and 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 they tra- it translated really really well. You know, uh, so I don't really think I think yeah uh, yeah it's funny because like you know some people say you know do you play bebop? It's like hell I do yeah I do. And I, and I and I I love to sit down and play bebop, but I never get asked. Very rarely get asked to do it. You know, it's a it's a, 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 a I get you know rock or rock or R and B. That's what they, what people ask me to do. But I like to play play bebop. Oh, As I, a matter of fact, I want to see you. I go, yeah, go ahead, go, go go. I go I go and play. There's a little coffee shop. I play with this coffee shop trio. At eight o'clock in the morning, we play bebop out in uh, out in uh, Pasadena in a little coffee shop in Pasadena. Every once in a while, they call me up and say, "Steve, you want to come and play?" And I just go out there and we, and and, uh, and I go to like a little bass drum and a and a, and a snare drum and a right cymbal and sometimes a tom tom and, and we you know and I have, we play we play bebop. I and love I, it. it. I know, love it. People I love stop it. in there on their way to work and they stop and they listen and they love the music and it's it's really cool, you know. Is and, it- and then some people. They see me and they go, what do, wow, what are you doing there? What are you doing that? You know, I was like, I love playing that kind of music. Have, did, you, <laughs> did, did, you, did you have a chance to uh, cross paths with Miles ever? My- Once. But, I, I, you know, I didn't, I, uh, we actually, we played, we, we, we played on the same track, but we didn't play together. What track is it's that? A, it's a song called I'll Be Around, a Shaka Khan song called I'll Be Around. Wow. But he, uh, but he and, did his solo, and then you came in and did your. Drum. He played afters, but it was there was this uh, there was this at uh, the end of it. There's this groove. So, it's da, uh, uh, Dad Grusin was uh, playing. Sure, sure, and, uh, sure. It was a, like a live. It was a live session with Artis Miller. And uh, and 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 at the end of this thing, it was like, well, you know, just play. So so we so we so we started playing, and I started to play a couple of little things in this. Uh, and I played this one, this one sort of fill, and then Miles came in afterwards and did his trumpet solo. And when I got the, the when I, I heard the finished thing, the mix, when I got the mix, I was listening to it. And at the end, there was this thing, and I played this this little thing on the snare drum, a little little fill, and Miles heard it <laughs> and did and, and and played a flurry right after it, you know. And I'm like, dang. Miles Davis heard me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He did hear you. He did hear yeah. you. Now, exactly. you know, I mean, I mean, you know, at this point, I just would like to talk to you. I first of all, I need to come to one of those coffee shop bebop gigs. I would love to hang yeah. and grab some eggs Benedict there. But the like what what is still a challenge we're all we're all still growing in our own way, but I just want to talk to you on the bandstand. What is something that you still want to refine and work on in your in your bag? Well, you know, I, what I, I, you know, every once in a while they give me some they give me some big band stuff to play, and and my my reading is just not up in that area at all whatsoever. So I mean, I, I 
I, I'd really like to, um, to to sit down and play that a, a, a bit more and make that a bit more comfortable for me to play. I mean, it's like uh, I, I can get it, but it's, it 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 takes me it takes me a bit of work to to, to sit there and uh, uh, and play that stuff. You know? Other guys can just sit down, and look at it, and read it, and play it. And uh, 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 and I, I just uh, I'm just not that comfortable with doing that. Uh, even though I enjoy playing that style of music a lot, uh, uh, you know, there's other guys that are like way better at it than I am. But, but yeah, I mean, when I've done it, I've done I've done pretty well. But but uh, I, I I'd, I'd like to be, be a little bit more comfortable with that. I have to do a little bit more and uh, and just sort of get my. Um, my 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 knowledge of that a little bit better. Did I did I hear you correctly in the in saying you want being a more a better reader a better reader of music? Is that yeah, well, yeah, I, I would. Yeah, I mean, I can't really say that. It's, it's, well, it's just that I, I have this I have this problem that I start listening to it a lot, right? Right. And and and, and I sort of uh, I sort of play I play a lot of stuff with my eyes closed, you know. And then I play my eyes closed, and then I take my my attention off of the chart, and then I miss something, you know. And uh, I, I play a lot of it on instinct. I would rather be able to look at it and and feel comfortable looking at it and playing it, but it, it's it's kind of difficult for me to sort of feel the stuff and read it at the same time. If I could just sort of make that move a little bit smoother in that area, I I, I, I love it. I love the I I I love the feel. And I love the organic nature of just keeping your eyes closed. And I, I think a lot, a lot of pe- more people do that. Uh, yeah. And and yeah, some cats can read flypaper, but you know, it's like I exactly. I, I don't know, man. I, 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 you know, just just in closing, uh, I, we've got to do a, another uh, part three uh, at some point. Uh-huh. But I, I, can you just talk about uh, your relationship with uh, Alex Litcherwood? I, I love you guys so much, and. Uh, oh. And I just wanted you to talk about about uh, you know you guys are kind of basically from the same era you know I mean I I I just love your passion I love how smart you guys are and obviously just musicians the fire can you just talk about yeah uh, Alex? I, I was uh, I was seventeen I was seventeen years old when I met Alex wow uh, I w- I went to uh, went to Italy I went there for a week and I ended up staying there for three years um, and uh, um, and I met uh, Alex. And Robbie Robbie McIntosh, uh, uh, the drummer with AWB, the original drummer with AWB. Absolutely. Uh, they were playing in a band called the Senate, and uh, I was playing with a band called Mouse and the Traps when I first went to Italy, and then I stayed there and worked with a guy uh, named Ronnie Jones, who's a, uh, um, uh, he's a he still lives there in Italy. He's in, in his seventies now, and we're still in touch. He's a, a great guy, a great singer. And uh, and we used to uh, we used to stay in the same Penzioni. Uh, uh, I remember I, I spent my 18th birthday with Alex and Robbie uh, at, in the Coliseum with loads of cats. About <laughs> watching the sun come up, drink a couple of big bottles of cheap Chianti, <laughs> drinking and celebrating my birthday. So you know, Alex is one of my oldest friends as far as has been playing. Play. I mean. Um, I, I followed Robbie through through um, uh, 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 yeah, through through bands. I followed him through uh, the Piranhas and uh, and then into Brian August a band, and then finally after he passed away into into Average White Band. But uh, um, uh, and through all that, uh, I've known Alex for years, and he has an incredible instrument. His voice is an incredible instrument. It's ageless. He pretty much sings everything in the same key as what he did years ago, and he still, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how, I don't know how he does it since he smokes cigarettes and drinks. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think it's some people just they just never it just never phases them. I don't get, I don't understand how that happens oh, okay. either, you know. But yeah, he just he I has mean, an amazing strength in his voice, you know, just an amazing strength in his talent. It's a, uh, it's just a great guy, you know, yeah. Um, and, uh, I get to I get to play with I still get to play with him with uh, uh, with David Garfield and the Cats quite a bit. We 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 play together quite a bit here in Los Angeles. We do, when he's in town, or we're both in town. David calls us up and puts in a gig, and it's always fun to play with him. He's uh, he's, he's always been a, he always uh, as with Brian Alder. There's a certain attitude with those guys that they just love to play. 
and uh, and 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 in their in their love of playing is 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 uh, you get to love playing with them. You know? Well, we love Stephen Ferroni on the Jake Feinberg show, and it's so great to connect with you, man. And uh, let's just we'll do a we'll do a, a set three uh, around the holidays, and just keep keep cooking on this. Absolutely, and, uh, and if I if I do my uh, my uh, coffee shop the coffee shop trio gig, I'll, I'll drop you an email and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll let you know let you know that's happening, dude. I'll fly out on my private jet. Yeah, right. No, I'll, <laughs> <laughs> love always, man. All right, keep swinging, man. I see if I can get somebody to do a little film of it, and then I send it to you. Oh, cool. thanks for that bloodstone. Uh, the, you know that was a, that was a trip. I was sitting there saying, "Dang, that's yeah, a, I'm gonna that's I'm gonna send, I'm gonna throw yeah, yeah, you're all over that album, man. It's you're na- it's, yeah, it's yeah. nasty. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> all right, man. Thanks, Jake. Later, Stephen. Bye bye. Yeah. Hey, vote. Don't vote. Don't forget to vote. Don't forget to vote. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Cheers. I did mine already. So take it easy. All right, and we'll be, we'll be right back with Geraldine Brandelius on the Jake Feinberg Show. <laughs> 